So that's nice. As a guest speaker, Mr. Chris Kruger. Uh, he's a teacher by day and a fly tire and streamer expert by night. Uh, Chris owns and runs the uh, Rocky Mountain Fly Design. Uh, started that in 2014. Yeah, they're about. Okay. Um, if you look on his website, which is listed there, um, you'll see that uh, you can purchase uh, all sorts of uh, flies for sale as a made to order. Uh, his specialty is in tying and fishing for big, beautiful, with big, beautiful streamers. So uh, those, that's what we want to talk to you tonight. Chris is a uh, signature fly designer for the Montana Fly Company. So prestigious company there. He's also on the uh, pro team at Regal Vice and Whiting Farms. If that's not enough, his day job is uh, teaching at middle schools and a high school in Long, uh, in Long Love. So uh, he also works with youth programs doing fly fishing and teaching them all about that. So that's that's pretty neat stuff. So uh, his talk tonight will be uh, taking the guesswork out of streamer fishing and tips for success. Being in the uh, fall that we are right now, it's very uh, opportunity for us all to learn about how to do streamer fishing. No, I need some help on that. So with that, please welcome Chris Group. All righty. Let's see. We need to move this at all in here. There we go. You're good. All righty. Hey, uh, like you said, my name is Chris Kruger. I'm, I'm super excited to be here tonight. Um, I appreciate you guys uh, inviting me to come talk about one of my absolute favorite things, which is streamer fishing. Um, it is, it, as soon as we start getting any of that crispiness in the air, kind of that cool feeling in it, my blood kind of starts pumping and, and, and talking about streamer fishing. And uh, this is truly one of my favorite times of the year, all the way through spring. But really, we're going to talk about how to, how to find success and how to find um, application in streamer fishing all year round. And uh, really, this, this presentation and this, this uh, topic really is something that through going through the different shows and uh, meeting so many different people whose really approach to streamer fishing was, well, nothing else was working. So I put on a streamer and I caught one of the biggest fish in my life. And it was like, well, why did that happen? And as a teacher and a musician and all of those things, I'm always looking at why do things happen? What are the approaches to the ways in which we can replicate those results? Taking the guesswork out of it. Well, I guess they might be hitting on crayfish because that's what our local shop said. But if that doesn't work, where do you go from there? How do you approach fly fishing on a streamer mindset the same way that we approach anything else that we do with fishing, which is with information gathered by what we take from the stream. So a lot of that guesswork that we're gonna be discussing tonight is how to get rid of a lot of the, the uh, things that we maybe don't know the information on. So taking the guesswork out of streamer fishing. Uh, I've been a commercial fly tire since I was 15 years old. I learned how to tie uh, flies through a, a middle school program that I was a part of um, and it, it's pretty neat to be able to do that now and give back to kids um, as a middle school and high school teacher in, in Loveland. Um, I get to work with kids all the time and we do have a fly fishing and fly tying um, class that we have taught over there. So it's very near and dear to my heart, the tying portion of it, but there is nothing that uh, is anything better than catching something on your own fly. If you are uh, ever curious about the whole fly design process. Happy to talk your ear off on that one. Um, as far as uh, what we have is in in tonight's presentation, I'm a teacher. I'm used to having kids yell at me and throw questions up in the air, whether they're got a hand up or not. So if there's a question out here, please go ahead and just, just throw up a hand or, or yell your question out and I'll try to try to um, replicate it for the for the zoom call to make sure that we know what we're what we're doing in there. But my my approach to you guys tonight is to hopefully bring you home with some type of nugget of information in your pocket, whether it's one thing that you took from tonight or a whole bunch of things that you took for tonight to have you find more success and more fish in your net on the water, okay? 
So let's go ahead. Uh, what do most people guess on as far as streamer fishing? Okay. Why do they eat streamers? Why does this big flashy, big, you know, monstrous thing that is so much bigger than the little beta snimps that, that I've been throwing all year long, why is that something that a trout will eat? When do I fish streamers? When is it applicable to throw these streamers? Uh, what food sources are in their waters? What do the flies imitate? What does this pattern do in the water and why do fish find it attractive? Retrieves and presentation. And then the most common ask is, what, how do I get into this? How do I, can I use my dry fly rod? Can I use my nymph rod? Do I need to go out and buy a whole new setup? What is the equipment that we, that we have in there? And that can, we'll be talking about rods, reels, lines, and, and leaders. So let's talk first about what, what is streamer fishing, okay? Streamer fishing is a technique and style of fly fishing that is used to elicit a strike by a predaceous fish by triggering a territorial response or by imitating a natural food source in the water. Okay, it's a lot of different things. It can be limited to um, what is in your ecosystem, as well as the curiosity standpoint of a fish cannot pick up and see if it's food. They must eat something to see if it's food or foe. Okay, so there's there's a definition of streamer fishing that we have to just kind of set a baseline on that. Okay, so why streamer fishing? Why not? Uh, is my always my always my response? Why not streamer fishing? Okay. Streamer fishing is by far one of the most exciting methods of fly fishing there is. That's why I, I choose it on a consistent basis. If there's any possibility that streamer fishing is going to be applicable, it is my number one go-to. There is times and places for dredging a bobber, making sure you're dry fly fishing, fishing the hatches. But in my, in my preferences, streamer fishing is always my number one go-to. It is absolutely highly visual. It is something that you see that fish come out, take that fly, take it back to their little hidey hole and just have a great time um, watching fish come out and actively feed on your streamers. Number two, oh, go back for me. Okay, active retrieves. This is something that we fish, oftentimes we're fishing streamers in colder environments. It's an active thing, it keeps me a lot warmer than just sitting there in the, in the water. But it's also something that I can sit there and say, I know what my fly is doing under the water. I can hunt my fly. Um, you'll hear that, that said quite often in the fact that you are adding action to your fly rather than relying on a dead drift to, to imitate that bug through, coming through the water. You are actually moving that fly. It's active retrieval to get that fish to uh, believe that it's real. Okay, um, aggressive takes. There is absolutely nothing subtle here, all right? When you see that big brown come out of, of an undercut bank and hit that streamer, it's exciting. It is, it is to kill and eat that thing or get it out of their, of their area. Okay, they are often larger, healthier fish. These are often the, the predators, the alphas in that water system. So they're oftentimes really, really well kept fish. I mean, they, they are, are uh, have some extra weight on them. They have great colors to them. Oftentimes you're, you're thinking of fish in, in and around spawning times that are nice and bright and colored up. It's a, it's a wonderful time to, oh, we got a crash going on over here. All righty, um, heavy tackle. There is no six or seven X here, all right? You're throwing big, heavy tackle. If you're hooking up on the bottom, oftentimes you can actually pull that, that log or that limb or whatever you're hooked up on. You just pull it out. And if you have overcasted your bank system and you put it on the grass on the other side, pull it out. You don't have to worry about breaking off your tippet or, or any of those different things. And then the other thing is I'm a big uh, sucker for uh, bass fishing and I love warm water. And so in the summer when, when we've got runoff or, or heat going on, I'm on the warm water fishing the same techniques that I am on cold water. And so I can, I can do what I love all year round. Go ahead. All right, so let's talk about key reasons why, why fish actually eat streamers. Number one, it's food. Okay, it's a large caloric meal. It's a big piece of steak that's coming through the water. I, I'm a firm believer that at a certain point in uh, a fish's development, they will start keying in on larger caloric intakes rather than constant food source of insects. Okay, it's not that a, that a 30 inch brown isn't gonna come up to eat a drake hatch or a salmon fly hatch, but their, their preferences in what they are using for their food source changes once they become more, uh, 
visible to uh, prey or to predators from above. They become prey rather than the predator in the water. They are also exerting less energy for higher caloric uh, food intake. It's, it's a change in philosophy of how they are acquiring their food and their calories on a daily basis. Okay, it is a low exposure to danger. If you think about a 30 inch trout, the most of their danger is gonna come from above. It's going to be birds of prey. It's going to be um, certain things that are going to attack from above. They don't wanna expose themselves very often. So when they do, they need to get their money's worth. Okay, on foe, territorial response. Uh, like I said earlier, fish are, are, are curious by nature, but they if they're not eating for food, they oftentimes were fishing during spawning season where they're protecting areas, they become a little frisky, they do their thing. We wanna make sure they can do their thing with, without uh, affecting them, but at the same time, they're going to chase things out. And you'll see that in a warm water uh, application as well. When we're uh, chasing off bluegills and things like that off of beds, uh, there is a territorial response of something that is big, flashy, something that they don't understand what it's in there, and they are going to chase it out because they think of it as um, foe. Third thing on there is obviously curiosity. No hands, no feet. Only way to figure out if it's food or foe is to eat it and or get it or chase it out. And so in order to do that, they must eat it in which to, to figure those things out. Okay, so let's talk about food sources. Okay, let's break this down. And a lot of this is going to be based upon the same skills that you have in figuring out a mayfly hatch or what size uh, blue wing that they're, they're eating on in the emerging stage is look at the water figure out what's in your water system, do the, the time on the water, and there's no substitute for time on the water. But if you can go to that time on the water with the mindset of, I need to take in what this environment is giving to me and is also giving to the fish, I think you'll find more um, success on the water. So let's talk about food sources. Number one thing that I always think people overlook is leeches, all right? Um, pine squirrel leech is a great leech. It's worked in every water that I fish it in, whether it's leeches or not a great all around pattern. It's a great um, food source. But if when we're talking about leeches, we're talking about a hydraulic intake right off the bat. Okay, so they can range from anything from an inch to over uh, four inches. And I've seen them even go up further than that. They are abundant through the Rocky Mountain region. Um, they are a teardrop in shape, which works really well with some of the fly tying materials and beadhead varieties that we have to offer. They are swimming in an undulating and kind of eel-like motion, um, which is really noticeable um, in the water, both for fishermen and for fish. They also live a lot on the bottom, obviously sucking up things and you'll get them attached to different host sites. That's how they feed. But um, what you can know is that in all situations, we're looking at blacks, browns, olives, rusts, um, modeling of those uh, different colors in there and coloring, having a good coloration variety in your fly box will allow you to um, be able to find success on that water. Okay, they are an easy meal for trout. They really don't move very fast. Oftentimes they're suspended or they're moving or they're sitting on the, on the bottom. But in high water, oftentimes they will get dislodged. They'll be in the water column. Fish will have a nice easy meal to be able to come in, swipe and uh, have a good caloric intake. Some of the, the really good uh, materials that we have to mimic this, squirrel, rabbit, uh, marabou, things that flow, things that move, things that allow the water to move the fly in there. I'm a firm believer that in uh, the fact that if you are doing a still water application, that fly must move on its own during rest. Leeches is a good application for this, purely in the fact that you can strip that fly and it will continue to move in itself if it's full of rabbit and marabou and all kinds of things that undulate. Those types of things are applicable to uh, leeches. So here's a video of a swimming leech. What you can notice is that it looks much like that snake right like uh, swimming motion that we talked about. Imagine that that rabbit strip moving as it's going through. One of the biggest leeches that I've ever seen was up on the Maricom, or on the Great Reef section out by Lusby. And I was fishing small little pine squirrel leeches and it was doing okay, but it really wasn't, wasn't finding commit um, from the trout. All of a sudden I look down and I see this huge leech just kind of doing exactly that motion coming through and it walked right by me. And I've switched up my, my leech to a zombie snack which I'll show you what that pattern looks like, but it's a much bigger leech imitation and immediately started picking up fish that I had seen refuse that smaller leech variety. 
So knowing what's in your water, knowing the color that's in your water and the size that's in your water can be really um, effective. Okay, so oftentimes we think of, of our food sources as solid colors. Okay, but when we look at leeches, we're looking at a high modeling of different types of colors. You'll see rust, you'll see olives, you'll see all kinds of different things in there that um, we can really mimic with a lot of really natural materials. Okay, so if we're comparing, most of our leeches are going to be in that smaller size, but they do exist in the larger sizes. Pine squirrel leeches, one of my favorite imitations is to add a little bit of flash to it, a little bit of... Uh, of that kind of oily look in the water, which is that polar leech down there at the bottom. That's one of my top producing patterns and is absolutely just a, a, a killer pattern for leeches. Um, it's got a little bit of a dubbing on the front of it. So when I'm, in, when I'm trying to imitate that kind of slimy, uh, shiny look to a leech, that's what I'm going after because when that thing gets wet, we get that nice appearance in our fly design. Other, other options, woolly buggers, Mayer's mini leech, balanced leeches, bunny leeches, a thin mint is a great variety of just an all-around streamer that can imitate um, a variety of different food sources. Um, but that's that zombie snack that I was talking to you about earlier. Um, it is a this is a this is a black and gray kind of version of it. A lot of marabou to it. A lot of. Uh, a lot of rabbit and a little bit of flash in there. And when that thing is coming down as a dri dead drift and letting it swing down towards the end of a run or the end of a pool and letting it kind of just slowly move across, that's when I find the most success in, in a larger pattern. Yes, sir. Is the meat whistle a leech pattern? Is the meat whistle a leech pattern? The meat whistle can be a, a couple different things. It can be fished as a leech. It can be fished as a as a crayfish, they can be an all around general attractor streamer. So John uh, designed that fly to be applicable in a couple different areas. So it's a great, it's a great variety of, if you've got multiple options in your water, that's a great one as well. Okay, so the, the results can be some really nice healthy fish. This is a nice um, fish that was taken on the, uh, the Yampa on a leech pattern of that polar leech um, that we had. Next. Another nice, uh, nice fish off of uh, Gray Reef up by Lusby. That actually, that was the section that I was just referring to. Was just above that, um, right before you pull out um, on your your normal floats off the Gray Reef, eating leeches like crazy in that slow slack water. Okay, another another big cut bow. Um, ate a uh, hothead leech. So oftentimes when we're talking about eggs and leeches all kind of in the same time, putting a hothead, um, an orange bead or a chartreuse bead on the front of a leech can be a really great uh, pattern as well. Okay, one of the bigger things that, and something that I absolutely love is crayfish. Okay, so when we talk about crayfish, we're talking about there's eight species according to CPW um, that are in a variety of water types in Colorado, often dormant in the winter months, but they, uh, they mate in spring, oftentimes laying their eggs in May um, and growing to about an inch in the spring. So that, if we take about an inch in the spring and we're looking in the fall, that puts us in prime size for a lot of the crayfish patterns that you see on the market. There are a lot of different varieties in crayfish, um, but they are there's few varieties in the number of colors that they have in, in their normal uh, more normal time period throughout the year, okay? Uh, trout will often capitalize on, on crayfish exclusively and exclusively smaller crayfish that are easier to eat, easier to digest. Um, sometimes the, I've seen them go after ones that maybe only have one claw or don't have a claw. They'll capitalize on that food source. Um, and then when they are moving, we're looking at small uh, skirting act actions, uh, distinct jig in the water with that powerful tail, using them to, to move around as well as kind of crawling off of, off of banks and, and areas like that. So if we're talking about spawning in the spring, a distinct uh, jigging action, that's a lot of the different uh, streamers that we have in our, in our arsenal for a plethora of food, uh, food in the fall. Okay, so here's the, the different types of uh, crayfish that we have in our water. The rusty crayfish that you see, number one, is an invasive species here in Colorado. It's trying to be eradicated, um, brought over most likely by, by the bait fishing industry and, and food trade. A uh, lot of different efforts right now to get rid of rusty crayfish in, in a number of different water areas. Um, the northern crayfish is kind of our most 
the one that I fish towards most of, the, most of the time, as well as the Northern Clearwater crayfish, the uh, Kazi's crayfish, the ringed crayfish, calico, um, Kansas pond, and devil crayfish. Now, what you'll find in most of these, go ahead and go to the next one, is that there are common colors in most of these species. We don't have to be working on a specific variety of these, of these uh, crayfish. We can see that we have tans, olives, browns, and rusts. And that's really the, the majority of what we are throwing as far as Colorado-based crayfish, with the high majority of that time period really being towards those tans and olives, and certain times of the year having more of those colors coming out. Just like when we have our, our fish that are spawning in different areas, they're coloring up in different times. We also have species of crayfish that will find different color varieties as we're, as we're moving along. One thing I want to point out to you is look at the difference in sizes of claws. The claw size is very different throughout different species and varieties of crayfish. Um, and, but most of the body colorations are going to be very similar. A key component to the crayfish that we have in our area is those blue claws. Um, a little bit of blue in our patterns can be a, the difference between an okay day and a lights out day. Um, having just a little bit of blue in our olive crayfish are, are just awesome, okay? Um, the, the darker browns and the darker rusts, I'm about 10 minutes away from the Poudre River in Fort Collins. When I'm doing a lot of seining and things in the area, trying to figure out what's moving around, a lot of the times that uh, the, the northern crayfish here on the on the right, right above where it says talking uh, berry, which I'm not there, um, but it's close. Uh, that coloration is a is a high prevalency in a lot of our waters. Okay, but also that tannish olive, they match a lot of our substrate as well. Okay, so this, this is a big big fish that came out of uh, Miracle Mile up there. We were having a terrible day trying to figure out what in the world they were, they were doing. We had some weird weather things going on. And all of a sudden we started looking around and we started seeing pieces of shell coming out into the, into kind of the Bay Area of where we were fishing. Started uh, throwing up into uh, pieces of shell and, and even just carapace of, of crayfish and uh, switched up to a little uh, jigger knot, which is a little crayfish pattern of mine and a Mardi Gras, and just absolutely had a killer day pulling a big fish in uh, like that. That is a fat fish, and they were just gorging themselves on crayfish um, there. Colors range uh, throughout the season, okay? Substrate, temperature, those types of things, um, but color, common colors are what we just discussed with browns, olives, tans, um, and if you have those in a number of different sizes and, and uh, little accents in there, you can cover a large variety of, of species of crayfish. Um, claws are lighter oftentimes than the body. Um, there's a couple of the rusty crayfish and some of the northerns are do have a darker claw, but the majority of them are going to be a little bit lighter than the claws, um, which help them stand out to fishing those, uh, those flies to those fish as well. Our sizes, this is where it gets kind of crazy and it really depends on this on the water that you're fishing. Most of your sizes are going to be in that one to four inch range. However, you can find crayfish up to eight inches um, in a lot of our bodies of water and larger. Uh, might as well be small lobsters at that point, which is kind of crazy. So um, a rusty crayfish, like I said, it's found in, it was, uh, it's a, an invasive species. It was found in Colorado in 2009. Um, there's been a, a, a good effort to try to eradicate this species and keep it out of here. Um, it's de deemed an invasive species because it is, it is a very aggressive crayfish. It eats fish, it eats insects, trout eggs, it damages um, all kinds of substrate and, and areas, um, and it is, is not very nice to fish. Um, and so uh, what we try to do is, is if you identify it, um, you follow protocol for the CPW, you can find those in there, but getting them out of the water um, is, is what our, our effort is, okay? So they are, do have a large, smooth claw. It is very powerful. It will hurt, okay? Um, but it, oftentimes they have that those rusty spots on the back of their carapace, and that is where you can identify the difference between a dark northern and, and or a rusted up uh, calico or whatever it, your other species is and a rusty crayfish, okay? So uh, when you look at the differences, this is your rusty crayfish. They are big, nasty crayfish. Um, the size of the claws is, is really kind of one of the biggest uh, 
flags on there as well as you can see there's some rusty or some light spots behind right where you would pinch to pick up the crayfish would be either a rust or a, a much lighter color than the rest of the of the uh, crayfish. Okay, so let's talk about imitations. A lot of times what I do is I, I keep my crayfish in two different imitations, a realistic imitation and an imitative uh, or suggestive. Uh, and that realistic imitation, I'm looking for something with those claws. I'm looking for something with a high amount of weight. Um, oftentimes these are gonna be hop and drop um, type of situations where I'm going to be put them, putting them in small um, sections or shallow water and hopping them into deeper water as if that crayfish was kind of out in that sunny area and moving towards deeper water when feeling threatened. Uh, oftentimes, like you can see the crayfish at the bottom right, uh, they're not very big, but your, your hop and drop type of uh, crayfish pattern is going to be heavily weighted and allow you to put it right where you want it to and give it a couple hops. And a lot of times they'll, they'll smash it in the, in the shadows on that. When you're going to the next part of it, um, go ahead and go to the next. Uh, suggestive imitations are going to be things that will look like a crayfish, much like the wheat whistle that you uh, looked at earlier. Uh, it will be suggestive of that crayfish profile, that crayfish coloration, and that crayfish swimming action. Ones that I really enjoy, one of my top um, patterns in my entire catalog is the Mardi Gras. It's produced by Montana Fly Company. I have caught fish with that with that fly in every water that I've ever thrown it on. Warm water, cold water, doesn't matter. I have people that throw it for salmon um, and overseas and all kinds of stuff with different variations. It is an absolute killer little pattern. Um, and uh, you can do it with claws, without claws. Uh, it's just a great one. I've got a whole bunch over here that you're welcome to come uh, take a look at in the different varieties of colors, but it's, it's something that as a designer, my mind is always working on a couple different concepts. I was, I was at home, I was sleeping, and I had been working with this, this idea to try to get this, this uh, pattern to, to make sense with uh, beads using a segmentation of the carapace and using uh, a whole bunch of uh, different uh, Whiting Farms feathers to make the modeling work because there was working with it. And all of a sudden, like 3 a.m. in the morning, I woke up and I was like, these 3D beads that had just come out from Hairline. And I was like, I bet those, because it was everything was too heavy. These are a plastic bead that we use for articulation on, on articulated flies. I threw them on a hook, I tied the pattern, and uh, it's evolved into a, a number of different colors and options. Um, and it's just a killer, killer fly. Available on my, on my uh, website, as well as in uh, lots of different fly shops around, around the state and around the country. So when I talk about big crayfish, this was a, a lake up towards Red Feather, Colorado, um, that I was in a belly boat and I was fishing. We were freezing cold. There was ice all over the, the uh, right near the bank. And we were out there just freezing, you know, your little tush off. And uh, all of a sudden I saw this really weird disturbance. And up on the ice shelf came this gigantic crayfish and it had been spooked up and actually went to fly, do a fight or flight, and it went up and actually came up onto the ice shelf and was had, it had its claws kind of hanging up on the ice shelf and this rainbow trout came up and just took the entire tail and ripped it right off in front of me. And I was like, I mean, I'm sitting there not believing what I had just seen. And then still sitting there was the picture that you see right there. There's no tail left on there. It had ripped everything off of it and that, that crayfish was still alive. And then I, so I, I switched up to um, a bigger streamer, threw it right back over there and it still had it in its, in its mouth, came over and took that, that crayfish imitation and just, it was amazing. And so I, I picked up this <laughs> crayfish that's sitting on an ice shelf trying to, you know, live and uh, put it on my belly boat and measured it. And that's without a tail. You can see how big that crayfish really is. Um, it's pretty incredible. And so that fish, to see that action happen right in front of me, it's those types of things that, that change how you look at, at water around you. I had never thought that there was a crayfish that big, nor if it's like a shrimp tail, just popped it right off. <laughs> So big crayfish, I often go to articulated um, stuff when you're talking about uh, Delaney or some of the bigger reservoirs and, and some of those big crayfish varieties that, that live deep most of the year that come into the shallows. Um, and it's always perfect timing in that browns are also spawning and it can just be a, a 
wonderful lights out day. Um, those bigger crayfish, I also have some of those up here. The model craw is a great variety. It's got um, these these claws that just kick up and they're completely weightless and they move around and it looks like that that crayfish that's actually going up into a defensive position, much like another one that I really like is Al Ritz fighting crawl. Um, that's another really great imitation of a fighting crayfish um, having their claws splayed out. Um, but there's some there's some great imitations and articulated uh, heavyweight patterns as well. So a, a large amount of the food that uh, fish will eat are going to be other fish. They are cannibalistic in nature and oftentimes they're also eating bait fish and suckers and minnows and all kinds of different varieties of different things. And it's one of the most abundant resources that they have in, in their water. After spawning, you've got a lot of little baby fingerling trout and, and small fry, and you will see those fish crashing the shallows trying to just gorge themselves. These can include minnows, shiners, suckers, chubs, sculpins, anything that is going to be a small bait fish in variety, and even immature trout where they will, like I said, become cannibalistic and eat their own kind. Um, trout will feed on small fish uh, exclusively for, for often the, like big blocks of time where they're just chasing um, bass do this obviously with bait balls and things like that. So it imitates um, our, our large minnow population in some of our warm water, that's a good crossover uh, and it can be a lot of fun. Okay, so chubs and suckers, let's look at the different, I mean, we're looking at similar color schemes. We're looking at tans and golds, a nice black bar going across, we can, which oftentimes can be imitated by the use of rubber legs or barred, um, a barred hackle or schloppen. But they are opportunistic feeders. So this is a, a fish uh, by a good buddy of mine, Aaron Alexander, um, who was fishing streamer, streamers. And it, I see this all the time online as well, as it's happens on the water, um, is that fish will not be done with their own meal, their first meal, and they will be so opportunic, opportunistic that they will actually hit that fly while they're still digesting their first meal. So this is a fish that is still digesting a, a, a fish. I believe that was a chub. I um, know well, actually that's another, that's another trout. Uh, still digesting it and actually ate that streamer while still having the tail hanging out of its mouth. Um, they will often eat, eat things up to half their body length. So when people say, what's a big streamer? And I always have to say, what's a big streamer to you? Oftentimes people are, who are getting into <coughs> streamer fishing that's a big streamer is, a, is like a size six hook or size eight woolly bugger. Um, even a size 10 woolly bugger oftentimes like, I don't know how to cast that. I don't know how to do anything else. And so I pull out a big pike or, or musky fly and say, this is small for, for musky or small for pike. And, and then you'll show them some of those 14 inch long streamers. And that is a big, it's amazing what fish will eat when given the opportunity to feed on something of high caloric, uh, value. Okay, this is a good friend uh, who was who was fishing this this big rainbow here he was uh, crashing small little fingerling uh, and fry in the shallows. And uh, that's a that's a, a big fish. <laughs> and so uh, for Colorado purposes, that is that's a that would get me to throw the big fish in the shallows. Okay, talk about sculpins. Sculpins are something that you oftentimes don't see, but you know they're there until you do some seining or maybe you do some electroshocking or you uh, volunteer for, for one of those things on the, on the water. Uh, sculpins, these are sculpins taken out of uh, Summit County outside of Granby. Um, and you'll see the differences in coloration that you have between the two sculpins. Oftentimes when we think of sculpins, we think of that dark olive, big head, big pectoral fins, they've slimmed down. We're talking about, uh, you know, the big dungeon flies and things like that um, to imitate that. Oftentimes we forget about the lighter variety or kind of that orangish tan variety that is also in the water. Um, oftentimes being a lighter in color, they're picked off more readily when they are displaced by water or movement or any of those. So uh, I just think they're one of the coolest things ever, just these big, huge pectoral fins and they're like little mud skippers in fresh water. So when we talk about what flies imitate them, like I mentioned, dungeons, things with big deer hair heads on it, wool heads on it, things that are going to push a lot of water, they do skip and they, and they pulse real quick. Um, and so a lot of times that 
that kind of stripping action can imitate those. Um, I oftentimes put uh, big pectoral fins using some kind of feather. This, uh, the, the cheeky sculpin there, which is kind of a dungeon variation um, from Kelly Gallup's dungeon. Um, that variety on mine highlights those pectoral fins by putting uh, pheasant rump feathers out there to mimic those, that profile of that, uh, that sculpin. The other one that I that I have the sculpt gulp is a very popular pattern. Um, I absolutely adore that pattern. It's one of my um, must haves and, and one that I, I never leave home without between that and the uh, Darth Invader, um, which is the articulated version of that. So I have the, the articulated is Darth Invader. That's the, um, the bigger version. And the sculpt gulp is the uh, smaller version. They both have a, uh, a more streamlined profile that kind of allows the head to feed into the body and slims down really nice and well on the uh, working on the on the sculpting profile. Okay, so when we compare those two down there, this is a smaller sculpt gulp in comparison. You can see that the, the barred legs, the barred top, um, you can kind of imitate some of those uh, smaller fry with just downsizing some of your patterns. I don't carry a lot of different patterns. And as a fly designer, that's kind of hard for me because I want to always carry a thousand different patterns. But I really stick to some key component patterns that imitate a variety of different species with just slight alterations in that pattern. Okay, so they will eat trout. They are oftentimes cannibalistic. Um, and oftentimes they're in this size uh, that they are attacking them um, as well as when they are, have absorbed their, their, uh, their sac and they are in the shallows trying to sit in vegetation. You'll often sometimes see um, bigger fish kind of cruising shallows, especially in still water as they're searching for food um, in that vegetation. So when we compare some of my, my favorite patterns for fishing small uh, small bait fish patterns, um, the upper left-hand corner is a pattern called the Iced Up Baby, okay? And that is a, a pattern that uses primarily iced up and two feathers for the tail. Um, and then it's just a wrap on the inside. Very, very quick and easy pattern. If you're not a, a nightly tire or you're, you're kind of scared away by some of the the high-end material, you know, some of the stringer patterns have a, have a huge list of materials on them. That's a really quick and easy one. It's just a couple of clumps of ice dub on the top and bottom. You can have a bunch of different colors, add some other things to it. The silver streaker, um, that was one of the 12 patterns that was in uh, Pat Cohen's new book um, for, warm, for warm water. Um, works really, really well in a variety of different colors for trout. And then obviously down there on the bottom is my two must-haves. Um, which is the Darth Invader and the uh, Sculpt Gulp, which is going to be in Pat Dorsey's new book, which just came out. So make sure you support Pat in that. Uh, so territorial response. So let's talk about those, those fish that have nothing to do with food right now. They are not eating for food, but instead they're just pissed off fish and sitting in there trying to keep everything out from coming into their area. There is a territorial response. A large trout will strive to protect their own environment and Kind of take over their domain. They are the alpha in that area. Uh, many times this is spiked by spawning activity, but not always. Oftentimes the biggest fish will eat first. We see that in nature a lot of different ways. Whatever the biggest blank is, you that they have first refusal of food, they have first refusal of mating, all of those different types of things. So oftentimes a, a, attempting to trigger that response with large, very flashy, highly flashed uh, streamers can often trigger that territorial response. So large articulated flies, oftentimes the reason for articulation in flies is to add length and motion to the, to the fly. But if you think about if you're throwing a, a six or seven inch streamer and you have one solid shank all the way through, that's a lot of leverage to pop that fly out once you do hook up on that. So by having a shorter shank uh, hook in the back, you're landing, uh, you're gonna not get those, those tail swipes, but most of the time those fish are gonna eat by the head and you have a smaller shank uh, streamer hook on the front in which to fight that fish for uh, a better success rate. Okay, so we talk about alphas, you'll oftentimes see that uh, kite, uh, that hook jaw in the front come in during, during prime uh, spawning season as well as some of our winter seasons, but these are big bad fish that are, that are there. They're oftentimes in either the front of the run or the back of the run with some of their smaller 
counterparts in, in the middle of the runs, um, but they are dominant alpha fish that clean up. Their job is to clean up the dead, dying, and decay. They are they're the, the hoovers of, of that water system. They're there to make sure that nothing goes uneaten that should be eaten, and, uh, and it's just a lot of fun to, to be able to do that. So big flies equal big fish. This is Colorado River that I will, um, that it, he was fishing big Darth and baiters, big healthy fish, just really, really fun fishing with big flies. Okay, so oftentimes I'm throwing these three varieties for my large streamers. These are gonna be my three go-tos. And the reason that I'm fishing these is for different actions. So I, I choose my different types of flies based on the action that they present. Some people like Kelly Gallup talks a lot about um, the difference in, in color choice, bright fly, bright day, those types of things. I go a lot by the action and the way that I'm seeing the fish react. So a lot of times, um, putting lead eyes or something heavy on the front is going to get that jig type action to it. You look at the buckle bunny there on the top, um, which is an, a weightless fly, and it's going to have much more side to side action or kind of erratic function to it. And then this dirty snowball, which is there on the, on the bottom right, um, does have, or, yeah, right. Uh, bottom right does have a, a little bit of that erratic kind of side to side motion as well, but with a little different look on it. Okay, so let's talk about equipment. What is our equipment needs? Can I use my dry fly rod to throw streamers? You can, you will not be happy at the end of the day. Okay, and you probably won't go back to that. So let's talk about necessities. You need something to be able to turn over large flies. And it's not the fly that you're necessarily turning over, but it's the line that you're throwing that is going to make sure that your day is, is happy and successful in those types of, of things. So your rod needs to be able to turn over sink tips. It needs to be, be able to turn over uh, heavy lines that are going to, in turn, turn over heavy flies. Um, key word is ease. Really, your rod should make life easier. Um, but matching the right line to the rod and the right fly to the line, all of those different things make things really easy to throw a large streamer. Okay, my reels, um, I'm looking for something of large arbor, picks up a lot of line at a, at a quick pace, um, large capacity to hold those large heads and those large um, line diameters, uh, good solid drag. Like I said, these are not finicky fish. These are things that are going to pull and that tug, like you've heard the tug is the drug, they do pull and you want something to be able to slow down that pull and, and manage it in a, in a good way. I always make sure that I have a good solid sealed drag. I make sure that I have uh, high quality materials in that, in that reel because that's going to be the best connection between me and my fish, okay? I do enjoy something that is uh, easily adjustable right there on the side um, and a palmable rim in case I need a little extra um, on that on that drag system, okay? Uh, I do carry a number of different spools in the bag when I fish. So something that has ease, ease of access to a number of different spools so that you can switch out different uh, rates of sink in your lines is always good. And then obviously something that balances the rod. That doesn't necessarily um, concern me a lot because to me, I'm throwing a big heavy rod, I'm throwing a big heavy reel. It's, I'm, it's gonna balance, and it'll be fine, right? Um, but some people are really susceptible to that, okay? Lines, this is one of the most common, uh, I would say misconceptions about this is that a heavy fly achieves a lower depth. When in reality, the line is what is being used to accomplish the depth in your fly, not the weight of the fly to the line. What you are trying to do is, is figure out a line that will sink and, and be able to achieve whatever depth you're at and fish on a horizontal plane, okay? Oftentimes, um, my biggest uh, use of a line is gonna be an intermediate sink line, but I do throw sink tips on an on occasional basis as well. The reason I like an intermediate line is really because I can count that line down to achieve the depth and I can have that more controllable between both moving water and still water. Your, your sink tips, I try to go the longer the tip the possible that I can because I want the entire line to sink with that shorter leader to achieve the depth. The, the weight of the fly is the action that you get from that fly, okay? So, let's go back one. Sorry. Okay, so Colorado and Wyoming, uh, these are my choices is 
if I'm going to fish a floating line, which doesn't happen very often, but there are applications, I like a, a big fly line or something that's going to turn over a fast taper line, something that's going to have a big front to it, it's going to turn over that quickly, a clear intermediate sink, I'm still trying to find um, one that replaces. I'm hanging on to my last little bit of my clear intermediate sink lines that are truly clear full sink lines for the full length of that line rather than a 20 or 15 foot tip. Um, I like the entire thing to be able to sink. It's just more controllable for me. Um, and then based on the rod, matching the grain weight to the rod, 200, 250, 300 um, grain um, controls the depth of the weightless fly. Okay, leaders and tippet. Uh, these are my different setups based on the line that I am throwing. So oftentimes, if I'm doing a floating setup, uh, what you need to think about is the fact that the floating setup, the floating line will be above your fly. When, and when you strip that fly, it comes up and then sinks back down. You are fishing a broader depth in the water column using a floating line than you are if you're using any type of under the water line, sinking line or intermediate sink. So what I tried to do is I, I lengthen out the, the leader situation so that I have a little more control of that, which is a seven and a half foot zero X with two to three um, feet of zero X fluorocarbon tippet. You'll notice that I don't put fluorocarbon tippet on anything else. I'm not worried about the light refraction. I'm not worried about it in, in that it's the abrasion resistance because my, my tapered leader will get a, it's, it's not Maxima, which I use for the rest of the stuff. And so I want that little bit of extra abrasion resistance in that last little bit. Um, on a floating line, weighted flies, sink the leader. Um, small diameter tippet, also needed to sink it clearly. If I'm using a large diameter uh, tippet on that, it's gonna slink, sink slower, okay? Intermediate setup, I'm gonna be using a, uh, I tie my own leaders, I think it's, it's an easy way for me to dial things in. I've done it for so long, I don't even think about tapered leaders anymore outside of the application that I just talked about with the floating line. So intermediate setup, I'm looking at 24 inches, 24 inches, 24 inches, two, two, two in an intermediate, okay? And I go 20, 15, and then depending on my application, either 10 pound or 12 pounds. That Maxima, I use Maxima Chameleon for 99% of my applications. Love it, buy it in big spools. It's abrasion resistant. It's, it's strong, I, it does not break. It is absolutely by far my favorite and I trust it with everything that I'm fishing with. Uh, my sinking setup, I go a little shorter. So essentially the, the more my sink is, the shorter my lead up, leader setup gets. Uh, my sinking line, I'm going 12, 24, 12, um, and I'm going 18 to 20, uh, 15 and 10 to 12. Yes. Okay, so the other question is, what knot am I using to, to connect the sections? I use a blood knot. Yeah, it's to me, it has never failed me, um, especially with larger diameter lines. I like a blood knot connecting the different sections, um, and that's that's my my choice. Um, connecting to the fly, always a non-slip mono move. I want that fly to be able to move unrestricted. Okay, I never have a cinch knot to a to a fly that you want to move. Okay, um, so I'm always using a non-slip mono loop. Yes. What's your opinion on this ultra green maximum? That's all I use is ultra green maximum. Yep. Okay, so these are my setups. All right. Um, my six weight, I, I prefer a Scott Radian for small streamers, um, pack, matched with a hatch five plus. Um, on a nine foot six weight. It's a good uh, kind of small streamers. Um, it's, it's nice and, and light. I, I really appreciate it. It's flexibility, not just in the tip, but down into kind of the midsection of that, of that blank. And that allows me to uh, increase my accuracy and efficiency on small streamer setups. On my larger streamer setups, my favorite rod and I, am, I have repaired it, I can't tell you how many times, is a Scott S4. I love that rod. Um, it's a nice stiff blank, but still has feel to it. Um, I use it in a, in a, that's a mistake in there. It's a nine foot seven weight. Okay, it's a nine and a half I put in there. Sorry, that's a, incorrect. Um, and then a half seven plus. And then my eight weight setup is an eight and a half foot eight weight um, Scott Sector, um, which I absolutely love. And that thing is a cannon um, and it'll turn over anything big deer hair, big pike flies, stuff that I need um, matched with that same seven plus reel with uh, different line setups on. 
connection, fly line to leader, loop to loop um, is, I, I like that in some, but I, I actually prefer if you can just do a nail mount or an all run mount straight to from your uh, your butt section into your fly line. It's it's better, it's gonna sink better. It's going to be less issues with if there's moss or anything in there that loop sometimes um, catches some things. So I go straight to um, or a loop to loop. Cut off the seal to weld loops. I've had a couple break on me and it's kind of ruined me for life. I'm sure that they're fine now, but I've had a couple of welded loops that have that have uh, broken on me. So the first thing I do when I get a new new fly line is I I tie my own butt section and and uh, and section on the on the end of that just because I it's it's broken for me before. Some people have no problem with it. That's probably a me thing. Okay, leader to leader uh, blood knot, um, and then tip it to fly non slip mono loop. Uh, with everything else that's cinched up against it, restricting movement. Okay, so presentation. That's really what it's all. We can do all these things right, but if we're not putting the fly in front of the fish's face, we really are not gonna have very much success, okay? Um, so this isn't dry fly fishing. However, you still need to worry about presentation. Where is that fish gonna be? What is the environment that it's living in? How do I need to get it in front of its face? Which direction in the river is it facing? A lot of times those back eddies and stuff, you, you may look at it and that fish might actually be going against the current because of how the food is coming into it, okay? Um, but a lot of times you're looking at ambush points. You're looking at um, areas where it looks fishy. There could be a fish that put, it, put a fly in its face, all right? Um, I always say put it on the dinner plate because that's where I want to I want to put it. Um, you're looking at two, three strips and you'll have a you'll have some type of reaction hopefully to, to go on. And watch your fish. If you see a fish come streaking out after it, um, you gotta change some things up and we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. Okay, so there's three different, or two different presentations that I look at is inline presentation, which is parallel to the fish. You're actually casting up or down from you and fishing parallel to the fish of where they're at or to the bank. And then a broadside presentation, which is your most common, especially if you're in a boat, you're, you're pounding the bank and you're bringing it back towards you. If you're uh, wade fishing, oftentimes you're, you're only fishing within 30 feet. Um, that's really, as, as much as I go, but you're trying to find angles to, to approach that fish, okay? Speed, it really depends on temperature, on, on the uh, metabolism of the fish at that point, um, and typically colder weather, slower retrieve, um, but you still gotta make it look like you're hunting that, that fly. You want that thing to look alive. Okay, so our basic retrieves, strip retrieve, that's just gonna be your basic strip retrieve. You're letting the strip uh, add motion to that fly. Um, that's gonna be one hand directly in, grabbing the fly, just coming straight in um, with varying tempos to, to allow yourself um, to, to fish that fly. Um, your jerk strip retrieve, this is kind of a Kelly, Kelly Gallup thing where you're, you're adding a, an action of the rod and the strip of the, the line in which to make the action of the fly. Um, and then swing, uh, quartering down from the river. So I present myself right straight across the river and then I, I throw it straight across the river and let it swish, uh, swing down and across and let it go tight line across um, a wherever I'm fishing at. Um, that has a very specific look to that fish. Um, if you have it as a swing and that thing is coming across, oftentimes if I don't get a take on that, I'll do the same thing and I'll add a little motion to it, which is that last part, which is the swing and strip. Um, and so I'm adding a down and across presentation to it, but I'm also giving a little action either with the rod tip or even just moving the line. A lot of times that will trigger that fish to, to bite. So when to fish streamers? Honestly, anytime. I fish streamers. 365 days a year, 24-7, um, um, and I, I have found success, okay? Obviously, if I've got a nice big drink hatch going on, I'm probably not gonna be throwing big articulating streamers, but I found success fishing streamers any time of the year. Your prime times throughout the year are going to be your colder months, um, which fish are, are looking for caloric intake. Um, they are predatory fish, so they're oftentimes um, more active with overcast skies, with dark, um, kind of that, that perfect photography light, if you know what I'm, I'm talking about, um, and then towards dawn and dusk, so low light situations. They're more secure, they can come out, they can hunt, they can do those things, um, as well as the overcast skies, 
there's a there's a refraction off the water. It's harder to look into the water when you have that refracted or or uh, diffused light coming down towards the water. Whereas if you know that if you have a crystal bluebird sky, you can look right through that water. <coughs> that same thing goes for uh, predators up above. Um, Fish will become protective and aggressive. Obviously, we talked about that. Be aware, please, of spawning beds. Do not fish towards fish that are spawning, actively spawning, or staged to spawn. Um, the time of spawning oftentimes will allow for fish to be more active towards a streamer. But if they're doing their thing, make sure you leave them to do their thing, OK? Um, that's just that ethical portion of, of what we're doing, OK? Tips. Um, there is no perfect method. However, there are things that, that have consistent results. Bright sky, bright fly. Oftentimes, if I've got a nice bright sky, I'm throwing white, chartreuse, yellow, some of those brighter colors. Um, dark sky, dark fly, blacks, olives, some of those um, can yield results. Though there's always been times where we've had a nice dark day and that white fly seems for some reason to be um, the ticket. So, uh, but that's a good way to start. That's a good place to start from. Um, focus on where fish are keying in on. Are they keying in on action? Are they keying in on color, size, all of the different variables? Same thing that you would do when you're trying to match a hatch um, or dry flies as well. Okay, colder water temperature can slow fish down. Um, focus on slow deep pools behind logs, anywhere that you think a fish could be put that fly in front of their face, okay? Um, and then oftentimes uh, when you have a fish that charges or flashes at you, that's a common question that I get um, when talking to new and experienced uh, streamer fishermen. When a fish comes out, you see that fish come out of the bank and flashes at it, but doesn't take it, what do you do? First thing, go right back at it. Okay, first thing, go right back at it, see if you can get that fish to come out again. If you don't, alter it up. I oftentimes will carry a, a rod with something slightly smaller than what I'm going on, or slightly flashier or more muted. You, you're changing something up. You're trying to get that fish who often is chasing it out as a predatory or a, a, a ter territorial reaction. You're trying to get that thing to say, oh, I've already seen this. I'm not going to chase it again. Here's something new. I'm going to chase it again and see if I, they'll take it that time. So altering something up will oftentimes re yield results. Um, and then persistence. Honestly, there's no there's no uh, shortcut for time on the water. There's no substitute for that. Spend time on the water. Learn your water. Learn your your areas um, and what the food and the and the resources have to offer. And you'll find more success the more you're on the water. Okay. I am uh, more than happy to help in any any way that you possibly could need. Um, obviously, check out my uh, my uh, both my YouTube and my website. I also do Facebook and Instagram. Lots of tying videos on there. Lots of videos that can that can help you get more fish on there. But uh, there's a couple cards still still up here if you haven't got grabbed one yet. But all my information is on the screen. Feel free to come. Uh, uh, shoot me an email or a contact or anything that you can do. I'm happy to help you. Like I said, I'm a teacher. I'm here to help you guys. There's no secrets or anything. I, my box is sitting on this table right now, and you can come up uh, and, and see everything that I throw on a consistent basis, um, and I'm here to help help you all. So, hope you got something out of it tonight. Um, if you got any questions or anything, I'm happy to take any questions that you got. Yeah? Two fish doubles. Doubles. Okay, so you're talking two flies, two flies at the same time. Sometimes, <laughs> typically, it's going to be your smaller, your small, your you're trying to increase numbers. Um, the the reason that I used to say no, I don't. I don't fish doubles often. I'm I'm more of a um, intentional single fly fisherman when I'm when I'm fishing for streamers. Um, however, on the water with Bob Dye one one day, and uh, that that fly for some reason we had a. We had it set up and the, the front fly was causing the back fly to have this really interesting action to it. And we were getting strikes based off of that reaction to the second fly. So when we were stripping the first fly, it was causing this little stutter in the back fly. And that seemed to be something that was that they were they were taking. Typically, I, I don't just because I can if something isn't working, I'm switching it up. If something isn't working, I'm switching it up. And I'm and I've got either on my hat or on, on my pack what I've tried, when I tried it, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out crack the code a little bit. Other questions? Yes, sir. Sight fishing for double? Uh, sight fishing. Um, oftentimes, if you can, I mean, 
Um, if you've got site fishable water, site fish is a whole lot easier, right? But um, I mean, high water, those types of things, low light, there are a lot of challenges with streamer fishing that don't cater towards site fishing. Um, often my, my approach is look where the fish will be. If I can see them, great. If I'm fishing in water that has high banks, I can see down in there, I see that fish in there, I'm gonna to try to get them to strike, great, that's a perfect day, that's wonderful, right? Um, not always the case in the water that I, that I fish. Yeah, see them, yeah, yeah. <laughs> why not, right? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Things are working, how often do you change plots? I change a lot, um, I really do. I change pretty frequently. I don't, I'm, I don't fish the same fly if I'm not getting, um, feedback there's a reason okay um if i'm fishing where i know there's going to be fish i know that i'm putting the thing right there i'm doing all the things i'm checking all the boxes and i'm not getting reactions or strikes switch it up right and there's i mean it's not going to be like every five minutes if you're not getting fish good because every situation is a little differently but i i have a tendency to to switch it up more often than some of the other people that i fish with um I, i'd rather come back to something and try, you know, if I've gone to my box and I've got nothing, that's a that's an odd situation. And I can kind of go, okay, well, things have changed. Has the, has the weather changed? Has the water warmed up? What is going on? But if you can kind of apply some of the stuff that we've got in here to cracking that code and taking that guesswork out of it, you, you have a pretty good idea of what you can you can tackle this fish with. Yes, sir. On the open water on the belly boat, uh, you're casting. What type of casting do you use for heavy flies and how far do you go out? Sure. So the question for Zoom is uh, when on still water or uh, in a belly boat, um, what type of cast will allow you to cast that fly as well as how far am I typically fishing? So this is a, a really common question on how do I get the fly line back up to where I can have an effective cast? And the, and the best thing I can I can recommend is do a roll cast before you actually throw to get that line back up on the on the kind of the water surface. Okay, so a lot of times if I'm fishing, especially if I'm sick uh, fishing sink tips or intermediate, that, that fly line's down, right? You've got to get it back up to where there's not so much resistance. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll just kind of give a roll cast back out and get that fly line back towards the top of the surface. And then you can just go with your normal, normal cast. I don't, there's no reason to false cast <coughs> in, in streamer fishing. Um, if you can load the rod, rod off the water surface and put it right where you are, it's, it's about an amount of time on the water at that point. Um, as well as the only time that I'm really false casting other than maybe one false, false cast um, is to change direction. And so pick it up, put it back down. If you're in a boat, pick it up, put it back down. Do a roll cast, pick it up, put it back down. Um, if you are in a, in a still water, uh, it depends on if you're fishing structure, you just put fishing drop offs on how far you're going to be going to be throwing. Um, and it really kind of depends on, on the lake. I mean, sometimes I'm fishing right off the bank and I'm throwing right back to the bank and coming into drop offs. Parallel to drop offs, you're looking for structure just like you would on on any of your river situations, undercut banks, down logs, big boulders, you know, deep water sections, things that are going to hold fish. Same thing that I'm going to do with a with a still water. And then if uh, if it's not, you're looking at okay, what's that lake bottom doing? Is it a big bowl? Is it a bathtub? That's oftentimes what we have around here, right? Um, so where are those fish sitting? Are they cruising? You know, a lot of times you'll see those fish starting to cruise the bank. They'll, they'll just keep going in circles. Are they eating in certain areas of there? You're just trying to track that code. And the non-slip slip knot. Yes. Do you keep, you change a lot of flies. Do you keep changing it with the non-slip or do you use a, like a little clip on the end of it so you can change it even faster? The question is, do I use a non-slip on everything or do I use a clip um, I'm in, with, with a non-slip? I don't use clips. Um, I If I'm using a really, uh, high profile fly that's causing my, my leader to spin. I oftentimes will put a little monofilament swivel in the in, in between the last section to help it kind of not have that twist, especially like deer hair bugs if I'm fishing for bass or something, or just big bulky streamers that's twisting things. Um, other than that, I'm just retying. And if I need to if I need to put another section of, of 12 pounds on the on the bottom, then I put another section of 12 pound. Um, but I'm typically if I'm changing up, I'm Clipping off and retiring. And on the um, 
that the, the, the flies with the claws? Yes. You say you let it go down to the bottom? You're talking about crayfish yeah, irritations? How do you fish those? Just let it go down and bring it back up and let it go down? Yeah, so the question is, how do I fish hop and drop crayfish imitation? So a lot of times what I'm what I'm doing is I'm fishing slower slack water. Okay, if you're doing it on a moving water situation, best case scenario is to kind of be parallel or around that slack water so you can fish it off of ledges and things and still water. I mean, fishing for bass applications and, and warm water hop and drop. I'm looking for rocks. I'm looking for structure. And I'm, I'm knowing that I have enough weight on that fly that it will vertically drop with a little bit of variation, right? I'm gonna put it right where I want it to and then either just give it some little little kicks with the with the line and watch it kind of hop and pop. Um, you can use the, the tip. To me, that's not as good of a feedback to me than I can um, manipulate it with actually moving the line. Um, but allowing that fly to come off the bottom and then come back down to rest, let it sit because like the Mardi Gras or the um, the guide craw, those are the kind of my two hop and drops that I they were like, Bert back craw is the other one, is that when it falls down, when the water comes back up, those claws come up. So I wanna let that thing come down, hit the bottom, it'll, it'll come back up with those claws because they're naturally more buoyant than the rest of that fly when it has to pick it up. Do you fish articulated streamers different in this still water versus the river? Not necessarily. I mean, you'll get, I mean, I'm fishing, I'm fishing the imitation like I would fish the imitation in regards. The question was, do I fish articulated streamers differently in still water than I would a single shank streamer? No. <laughs> no, I'm still hunting that fly. I'm still making it move and, and do what I want it to do. Um, and like I said, that articulation is more for the landing percentage and putting that hook further up into the, the pattern um, because we know that that fish in a predatory response is going to eat head first most of the time. Okay, even when you look at pike and muskie and things like that, they'll T-bone it. Well, if your hook is way back in the tail of that fly on a single shank, um, then your hook's out of the mouth or you're cooking and hooking on the outside, you just don't have a good hookup. And so if you can put that, that hook kind of middle of the fly and forward, and have that option, I would, I would say a, a, a large percentage of my fish are hooked on the on the front fly, or on the front hook, with the occasional, it's gonna hit on the front hook and then fall back to the back. You get the occasional tail swiper, but it's not as common as people think. Um, they're hitting that thing running. That's It's not a, I'm gonna nip the tail as much as people think. If I'm gonna ever clip off a hook, it is always the back hook, always the back hook. If I am in a spot where I can only fish one one hook, always the back hook. And oftentimes nowadays, I will actually tie it with a shank on the back instead of a hook because it's it's just I need the the motion or the but I don't need the hook. Chris from online yes. um, strategy and tactics on smaller water during low water fall conditions. Sure. Um, smaller water, smaller flies, typically. Um, more natural in colors. Um, without knowing kind of where, I mean, I, I typically go more natural and smaller, start with smaller water, low water, clear water, and kind of doing that. Like my favorite thing on the, on the Poudre River when it gets low and slow and clear in fall is a polar leech. A non, like, no extra flash to it, just a straight polar leech. And I take either uh, a little switch rod or a uh, just a single hand rod and I swing them through. So on still water, same kind of thing applies. Slower moving, suspended things, things that they can look at, that they can see, but in a more natural, um, more natural coloration typically is where my first go to is. There's always something to be said about throwing chartreuse. Mm -hmm. I mean, big, bright <laughs> stuff, but typically low, slow, and clear, I'm going more natural. Yes? So briefly alluded to something I read in the Landon Empire article many years ago, putting a small bead right in front of the, the streamer, which presumably that resembles uh, an egg. Uh, can, you, can you talk about that a little more? 
Sure. So the question is um, the application of putting a small bead or um, something in front of a streamer and why that what that emulates. Um, typically, it's it's a hot spot, right? It's something that's going to catch an eye or a, a glimmer. Um, I I mean, an egg sucking leech was was kind of portrayed as an egg, a leech that's on top of an egg at first. I don't think they necessarily hit that as much as an egg as they do just a hot spot. It's something that makes it stand out. It's something that's attractive to them. Um, so like when I'm, what I was alluding to was that I put like a bright orange cone on the front of my polar leeches um, and that just a hothead leech in, in my application at least is not fishing as an egg pattern in front, which might be what you're referring to, which is up the leader a little bit. I think that's a different application than what I was maybe alluding to, which was the hot head leech, which is more of a hot spot, like a hot spot nymph or something like that. It's just something a little different to catch on. Yes, sir. Just kind of following up with that, I was fishing the green Wednesday last week, and I, I had a big pattern of foul set point on the right. Mm -hmm. Near the mini leech. I think four. I mean, I got three fish. Awesome. That's great. And I caught them all in the leech, not on the fish. Yeah. And, you know, just like when we have two nymphs on something, sometimes they're coming up for the first one and dropping down to the second one. Sometimes they're coming up and wanting to grab it. If, it, if it's working and it's getting fish, great. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've seen fish come up and hit your indicator. Right? Mm -hmm. Are they eating that for an egg? Well, I, don't, I don't think so. But uh, you know, they'll come up and they'll come up. They'll look at your indicator, drop down, and grab whatever's underneath it. So sometimes I think it's just getting their attention on things, and then they're eating whatever the natural limitation is. Right? So that might be what you're finding with there's a there's an egg up there that's getting their attention, that's getting their their focus. Oh, there's a leech right below it. Boom. Because if you're catching them all on the leech instead of the egg, that might be the attractive. Dropping down and taking the invitation. Could be. Don't know. Yes. You were calling to say something about um, crayfish adding blue. I can see that. Yeah. So the question is uh, adding blue to crayfish. There, I love adding rubber lakes in a variety of, of colors. There's some really cool, my favorite rubber lakes for blue, and I put them in all of my uh, Mardi Gras patterns that have blue, is the pumpkin and blue fly enhancer rubber lakes. Um, they're, they're striped, so they go from pumpkin to light blue, pumpkin to light blue. And so if you're adding a little bit of that in there, um, Crystal Flash and Flash Blue is always a good choice as well, um, as well as, I mean, gosh, the, the, the materials that Hairline and stuff is coming out with, with all kinds of cool little sheens and colors and stuff on them. You can take markers, you can do whatever, something to add just a little hint of blue sometimes can be a real good ticket. Um, but I typically go uh, rubber legs. Motion, vibrations. Cool. Well, I'm happy to uh, to stick around and answer any other questions. Thank you guys for for having me. I appreciate it a ton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you guys are welcome to come up and take a look at uh, Chris's display up here. And uh, while we do that, uh, we can go ahead, Jerry, with the. Uh, all right. First one, hmm. last three numbers are four, six, and three. Come on.